Okay, so I will presenting um, our paper made by Young Fur, Clyde, and myself. Um, and we all got, are going to be talking about a cognitive architecture for mental processes involving mental models analyzed from a self modeling mental viewpoint. That is uh, <laughs> quite a title, um, but hopefully, after the presentation, you will understand every part of it. Um, so, we will talk about the following. Um, first, I will explain a little bit what a mental model is. Um, and we are talking here about mental models as relational structures in your mind. And I'll, I'll explain how to use them, how you adapt them, so learning or forgetting mental models, how you can control the adaptation of them. Um, then I will introduce um, our overall cognitive architecture for mental models. So basically a way that you can apply mental models to many um, scenarios in life and formalize them. So I will be talking about their use, adaptation and control. And then I will explain what we're um, adding in this paper, which is modeling these, men men these mental models as a self-modeling network. And then I will talk about the actual um, interesting part, how these mental models like evolve and learn through self-modeling networks. Um, and then I'll give a few examples of different cases of adaptivity and control. And finally, hopefully we'll have time for um, actually applying this to a scenario example, um, specifically flashbacks in PTSD. Okay, so first of all, what are mental models? Um, so there's this nice explanation by Craig that we often uh, like to use in our papers. So I'll just <laughs> read it out. If an organism carries a small scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it is able to try out various alternatives, include which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present and future, and in every way to react in a much fuller, safer, and more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. So in short, we have like a model in our head of any situation in the world. It help, this helps us to try out the situation, which is also called internal simulation. Um, then it helps us, these models, to react to the situation in the real world. So it helps with decision making. And we utilize the knowledge of past events. In other words, we are learning. Um, so that's pretty awesome. The mental models, it's a helpful thing we have. Then, um, so it, then he continues a little bit. Uh, with, explaining more what that means to have a, a mental model. So by relation structure, I do not mean some obscure non-physical entity which attends the model, but the fact that it is a physical working model, which works in the same way as the process of parallels. So it's kind of mirroring the world, real world process. Thus, the model need not resemble the real object pictorially, like literally, but it works in the same way in certain essential respects. So he says um, the mental model doesn't have to exactly mirror like the exact same thing in a real world, but the relationships between in the mental model will um, work in the same way as the real world process. So you can see that in the picture, we have a real world relation in a blue uh, blob um, with relations. And then there is a mental model with its own relations. So it kind of like can work by itself almost without the real world real world situation. So that's in short a mental model. Now we are introducing a cognitive architecture for mental models, um, how we're using them, how they're being adapted and how to control this adaptation. So it's kind of three levels. Um, the lower one is the actual use of the mental model, which is the internal simulation that I introduced in the code before. So that's kind of um, having those pictures in your head. Then we have a level on top of that, which is learning and forgetting of the relationships in the lower level. And finally, there's another level on top of that, which will um, control those relationships 
um, that you have on the, in the middle level that then control the, the relationships on the lower level. Um, so just for example, like the speed of learning. So you get a little bit in your head. Um, so in other words, the lower level is a relational structure, then adapting the relations and controlling the relations. Now in this paper, we are kind of introducing this as a self-modeling network uh, perspective. So the same three levels on the left, during simulation, adaptation, and control. And on the right, this kind of feeds into a base level with a mental model structure as a subnetwork. Then in the middle level, we have a first order self-model of a mental model structure. And on the top, the second order self-model of a mental model structure. So this might sound a little bit <laughs> like a lot of uh, model and self and mental words in one sentence, but I'm gonna get more into it so you will uh, understand. Oh, I already said that. <laughs> It's the same thing as the picture before. Okay, so we know what a mental model is. Um, I've introduced our cognitive architecture, and now I'll give a few different cases of adaptivity that we are also introducing in the paper. Um, so we have different kinds of learning that we support with this architecture. First of all, um, Hebbian learning. So that is introduced by Thomas Hebb uh, many years ago. And basically, maybe I've heard the quote, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. It's been researched that if there is the same like neural patterns um, activated often in your brain, then these uh, relationships between these neurons actually strengthen. So that's how you like learn because when they're stronger, they'll be like uh, faster or easier to, to activate. And then um, there's a few other types of learning that we also support. Excitability learning, information source, counterfactual thinking, other mental models, and fear of mind analysis. And then we have also bonding by homophily and attachment. So we've applied this cognitive architecture to all these uh, examples. So as you can see in the names of the, these are all papers that you can find um, online and also uh, most of them in our, in our book that I will introduce later on. So you can see that there's a whole variety of scenarios. We can actually like make any mental model scenario with this cognitive extra, um, architecture, which is pretty cool. Um, so for example, flashbacks, which I'm hopefully gonna have time to discuss later, or decision-making, or your uh, way of viewing religious God, um, or driving a car. So there's like a lot possible. And again, you can find all of this in the paper itself. Um, then the, the previous one was more about the middle level, the learning, and this is like the third level, the control. So I already quickly mentioned, for example, control can be applied with learning speed, adaptation speed, but it can also be control of persistence. So like how much the learning stays um, after you did something. Then we have control of communication control of observation and control of exchange. So again, a whole variety of different types of control that this architecture allows for. Um, and again, we have different ways that we applied this to in different papers that you can find in the paper and in our book. So it's um, similar ones from the ones before, for example, um, in therapy, in decision-making, in attachment models. So um, you have like the secure attachment and those things. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of possibilities here and it's uh, pretty cool that the architecture can just allow all of these to be modeled and formalized in a similar way. Okay, so I went through what is a mental model, the cognitive architecture, and I showed some examples of how this cognitive architecture for mental models in self-modeling perspective can be applied to adaptation and control. And now I have a few minutes left to discuss a nice example. So we saw already in the table before that we had the PTSD uh, flashbacks in here. So here you see that it applies heavy in learning and it has control of adaptation speed in the second line. So I'm gonna discuss that one now. And this is also uh, discussed in the paper more longer. So this is a self-modeling mental model of flashbacks in PTSD. 
I'll start with a little domain background and then show how we like made the model based on the cognitive architecture introduced in this paper. So first of all, some domain background. Um, PTSD um, happens when a course of events and some random stimuli accompanying them lead to strong negative emotions and this can lead to PTSD by adaptation. So flashbacks are like a symptom from these PTSD sometimes, so they can be triggered by the stimuli, stimuli that became connected to the traumatic event, so these random stimuli with the course of events, and these stimuli now can lead to strong negative emotions. Um, how can you recover from PTSD? But PTSD, <laughs> sorry, PTSD, um, you can't recover from a PTSD, I think. Um, you can recover by improving your emotion regulation. So you can't actually undo the stimuli that happened or things like that, but you can strengthen um, other neural net like neural networks in your brain by adaptation in order to like deal with the emotions that come up from these stimuli. So maybe that rings a bell of what I discussed about the heavy and learning before. So then we have our modeling methods. Um, so the goal is to introduce a computational network to address the different kinds of adaptivity uh, needed for development and recovery of PTSD symptoms. So these are a few different things that we want to be able to model with our cognitive um, architecture. First of all, on the first order level, so the middle one, if you think about the three levels, we have a mental model to learn the flashback and a mental model to learn the trigger. On the second order, um, we have impairing emotion regulation, metaplasticity, and recovering emotion regulation, metaplasticity. So that's kind of controlling um, how fast you are learning the emotion regulation um, patterns. So that's on the third level. Then we have strengthening emotion regulation. Sorry, in the second level we call it, but it's like the third in the three levels. And finally, strengthening emotion regulation, which is on the first order. So that's kind of the recovery um, process of PTSD. Um, so as I already spoke about, we have heavy in learning that we, uh, in, that we use here, which is neurons that fire together, wire together. So we use it to learn a connection of a trigger stimulus to the traumatic course of events based on sensory preconditioning. And then we have learning the connections in the mental model of the traumatic course of events based on observational learning, also using sensory preconditioning. And then we have to get better, uh, get better to like recover from the PTSD flashback symptoms. We have strengthening emotion regulation for recovery by learning the connections to the prefrontal cortex areas. So this heavy and learning is gonna either start the PTSD um, symptoms and it's also going to help to get them go away. Um, then we have second order adaptation. So stress reduces adaptation speed. So the more stressed you are, the slower you learn. I'm sure we all know the feeling of uh, studying the night before test. It feels like they're going through the material very fast, but not much is staying in your brain. <laughs> Um, so we have reducing the adaptation speed for the learning of emotion regulation connections to the prefrontal cortex areas due to high stress levels. In other word, words, if someone's really stressed, their emotion regulation is going to go pretty slow, the learning of it. And if someone is a bit less stressed, then the adaptation speed for this emotion regulation connections can be faster. So someone will recover better from these if they're less stressed. Is a bit hard because PTSD can be pretty stressful. So these are all things that our model can show. Um, so then we um, have the second order network models. So we moved, we translated the domain into a conceptual model, and then we're going to formalize this in a rule matrices format with connectivity, aggregation, and timing matrices. And this is going to go into a software program that has like a whole environment where you can easily make these kind of models in and not like. Again, you can find all of this also in the book and other papers, and then you can easily run simulations with it. Is my time up? I thought I heard from Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just move through this really quickly because I think I'm a bit out of time. So we have a conceptual model 
step has three levels. Um, I showed this before, so I'm just going to go through it. This is kind of what the conceptual model looks like. You can recognize the three levels. The lower level is like the base level network model. The middle level is the uh, first order self modeling level where the learning takes place. And the top one is control. Sorry for the but time is okay. Uh, no problem at all. Oh, okay, fine. Awesome. Okay, so I'll slow down a little bit. So on the bottom level, um, we see all these pink uh, circles and it has learning the trigger and the trauma. Um, the middle level is the learning. So basically, there are specific relations. So let's look, for example, as, at this SRSTE2 to SRSTE3. You see arrows going up to the middle level to WSRSTE2, SRSTE3. So that means that this is representing the connection between these two states. Um, and that's how the learning takes place because we're kind of conceptualizing the relationships between two states. And this means that this relationship can become stronger or weaker. And then there's, so there's two arrows going up from those two states. And then there's a pink arrow going down, um, which is what the learning is. And then from this one upwards, you can also see how the control works. Um, so the control is getting, uh, is being fed by three states two ones in the base level and the one in the uh, first order level and then that is controlling the middle level learning um, state so that way that's kind of how the architecture of heavy and learning works here and you can see that we have um, six places that we are doing this in so there are six places where the person can learn and this is kind of um, what it's showing, it's showing how someone is learning the mental model of the trauma, but it's those dots more on the left side of the model because that's where the trauma happens. And then the dots on the right side, those blue ones, is kind of where the emotion regulation takes place. Um, I won't go too much into the theory of like the the neuroscience part of the how these state what these states exactly represent, but that's like the overall idea behind it. But you can read more about it in the paper. <clears throat> okay, so this one I'm actually just going to skip, but that's like how it's being formalized in these matrices. Um, these are some formulas that we use. So we use an advanced logistic sum function, um, which makes sure that a value doesn't like go out of the way, because you're, as you see, the way it works, we're like over time, we're aggregating values more and more. So we don't want the value to go out of bounds. So we're using this uh, logistic sum function. Then we have the heavy and learning function, a step one function, which is just helping us to start up the simulation with, with providing a one time trauma experience. And step mod means that it comes back every so often. So that's the trigger because the trigger will come without the trauma sometimes. Um, here you can see the simulation. Um, so I'll just quickly show that's how. So basically, we have the conceptual model. We formalize that into these matrices, and then we put that into the uh, software environment, and then you can run these simulations, and you can play around with the parameters um, in order to see what happens if you change things a little bit. So this is a development of PTSD without using therapy. Um, we can see the trauma starts at 100 to 200. Um, time. This is like Q1. Um, and then you see that the trigger keeps coming back. And that also means that the execution of the bad emotions, which is the uh, ones all the way on the right, D S B uh, T E and E S B B, those ones also get activated because of the trigger, not because of the trauma. And we don't want the person to feel these things just from a random trigger. Then here, we have um, development of PTSD and recovering using therapy. So you can see that the person gets a, a trauma stimulus and a trigger stimulus, and he's getting the bad emotions from it. But then the therapy starts working after some time, and the person learns emotion regulation. And at some point, the bad emotion activations start actually not being activated anymore because the person learned to regulate their emotions. 
So to discuss this, um, I introduced an analysis of self-modeling, a self-modeling network approach to mental mental model of mental models in mental and social processes, and introduced the tree-level cognitive architecture um, in order to support control adaptation. And we have some different options for adaptation of mental models and their control. Um, and this is all from a self-modeling network perspective. Um, hopefully in the future, we can allow for an even wider variety of scenarios to apply this cognitive architecture approach to. Um, so again, you can read more in the paper and also in our book that is uh, being published by Springer, Mental Models and Their Dynamics, Adaptation and Control, Self-Modeling Network Modeling Approach. So if you're interested, you can have a look.